Great. So it's now time to meet our sp second speakers for this evening. And we're heading over to New York to meet George Lavender, Nick Ace and Sanook Kim from the agency Collins. So founded by Brian Collins, um, this independent studio works across strategy, design and communications to combine creativity, craft and technology into ideas and experiences that improve people's lives. Over the years, Collins have carried this out this mission for a variety of clients from Spotify, Twitch and MailChimp and the many more which we'll be discussing today. So hi, everyone. Could you all turn on your mic and cameras so that we can say hello? There we go. Hello, Lucy. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi. everyone. <laughs> well, yeah, welcome to Nice and Tuesdays Online. It's so nice to have all three of you here today. Um, and yeah, you're not going to be giving a talk this evening. Um, I just get to ask you lots of questions. Um, and so does our audience today. So yeah, just another reminder to everyone that if a question does come to mind at any point, pop it in the chat and I'll try to ask it before our time is up. Um, yes, welcome everyone. I guess to start with, in line with today's theme of uh, finding a tone of voice, I wanted to first ask how you would each describe Collins's creative dialect. <clears throat> I think, Lucy, um, I've known Brian Collins for probably about 14 years, and I started working with him eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And when you start at Collins, and something I think we constantly remind each other is something that Brian said. Um, Brian tells us, he tells our clients, design is not what we make, um, but it's what we make possible. And I think the best way to describe how that plays a role in our work is when you get to the launch of a project and executives, designers, product teams, external partners, marketers, anybody knows what that company believes, how they behave, and how do they execute on that in new and surprising ways. For me, that's everything uh, in regards to how we approach our work. No, that's great to hear. And yeah, I would love to also ask around kind of, I mentioned it in the introduction there, but in the biography of Collins, you kind of express how as an agency, you create ideas and experiences to improve people's lives. And that's quite a bold outset to have to go into work and try to improve people's lives. But could, yeah, could you maybe tell us a bit about where that stems from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we first got this question, and we didn't think this was a necessarily a bold statement but something that we were naturally inspired by um, the predecessors of art and design and what they've done to our society and culture as a whole and i feel like we're doing our part here as a creative at collins thinking about the real life consequences and um, implications of design but also bringing something unique to the table a new perspective and what we're trying to do is push a needle forward to push the visual culture as a whole. And maybe I'm hoping someday uh, what we do at Collins will inspire a kid from South Korea, where I'm from originally, to design like an album cover or something. So that's what we're hoping for. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, sorry, would either of George or Nick, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I, just, I, I think- wanna... George, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, I think that is that is what we we strive for within every project, um, whether or not we achieve it. Um, you know, that's to be determined. But I think it's always our goal to try and make um, a noticeable impact, whether that's a business impact, cultural impact. We also tend to focus more on what is the overall outcome of a project, not necessarily the, the specific output. So not just focusing on those um, elements which we create, but the actual outcome of that element and what that can mean to transform a business or help shape a culture. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Yep, that's brilliant insight to have. Um, I suppose out of interest on the back of this and with today's theme in mind as well, I was wondering out of interest, how important do you feel it is for a studio or agency to have a self-defined tone of voice? Or maybe in contrast, should an agency operate with a flexible tone that's dependent on the clients that it's working with? Uh, George, do you mind if uh, I give part one of this answer. <laughs> Please. So I think one of the things that attracted me to Collins and hopefully attracts that next young designer from South Korea is that we're a very category agnostic company. Um, I think we're successful when our clients are successful. And it would be a miss for Collins to only do automobiles or only do beauty or only do beverage or packaging or anything like that. I think in general, when we find clients whose ambition and imagination lines up with ours, that's probably the sweet spot we want to be in. Uh, whenever we approach this kind of work. Yeah, 100%. I think the the flexible tone, it not only comes from the type of clients that we work with, like Nick says, being category agnostic and kind of being chameleons that we are. I think also um, Collins is the kind of place where we have um, people on our team from all corners of the globe and more people on visas than I've ever seen at any company <laughs> before, myself included. So I think like that coupled with um, our appetite for a diverse range of clients with different ambitions. Um, yeah, I think the flexible tone is something that, again, we always strive for. Um, and Lucy, may I add just one more thing to sort of put yeah, a bow on? the young designer from South Korea or, you know, the amount of visas um, that are really spearheaded by our head of talent, Jocasta La Chapelle, is that in the past eight years, I feel as though our work has gotten stronger, more diverse, more original, because suddenly you have a gentleman from Thailand collaborating with a young woman from Warsaw, Poland, or you have somebody from Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, collaborating with somebody from Wasilla, Alaska. So the fact that we're always bringing in these unlikely collisions of minds, of creative point of view, for me, that gets stronger every year um, because of that. Yeah. Definitely. No, that's amazing to hear. And I'd love to hear just because of because of the breadth of the clients that you work with and the different creative executions that you have. I was wondering when you have those first conversations with a client, what are the ways that you define a visual tone of voice together? Are there like any regular exercises that Collins encourages or maybe an approach that you have? Mm, yeah, I can answer this question but um, everyone please feel free to like chime in but we often do visual provocations which are essentially like references of any kind it could be visual um, audio or it could even be like a writing uh, from a book or a poem but to really align on the visual tone of voice together uh, with our clients and sometimes it could stem from something from their past and we find a way to uh, interpret it in a new way and other times we would bring um, references that are intentionally a huge departure from where they are that really makes them like nervous nervous um, in an exciting but um, disruptive way and by kind of constantly navigating between something that feels familiar to them and something that feels like new expressive and dynamic uh, I think we often find a middle ground uh, with our client. That's great. Was that Nick and provocations. Yeah, I was just going to say the visual provocations kind of 
process is, is such a great barometer. You know, we often talk about wanting to provoke and challenge clients and push the work and um, having that kind of free flowing part of the process is a great way to find out where where the right amount of scary is before we push it. But there's also um, obviously a huge kind of strategic component before even any of that comes up um, where we sort of immerse ourselves in the business and we talk to um, key stakeholders, but we also talk to, you know, people from all levels of the business to understand what their experience is like. And I think that's what we really try to bring um, to the fore in, in the tone of voice is not just what our kind of instinct is telling us, but really hearing um, their background, what their experiences and sort of letting that shine through. Mm -hmm. I love that saying the right amount of scary. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would be great to maybe talk about this in, in an example of a project. And it would be great to discuss your recent work for Sweet Green, um, which I think is the most recent project of Collins's that we've covered on It's Nice That. But maybe for the benefit of our audience, could you give us a bit of a background to the brand and that initial brief that they came to you with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So Sweet Green is a healthy, fast, casual uh, restaurant chain, and they serve really delicious but healthy salads and bowls and like other things as well. And they have been the leader in the food industry, and they really like work towards to create the um, the future of food and creating like healthier communities. But as they were a huge leader in the industry they quickly saw like other competitors like follow their suits which is a nice change but they also um needed a change to make a departure from the competitors so that's why we were brought in and working together um with the sweet green team okay yeah and the, the sweet green project is such a brilliant example of the many areas that collins can work within you know you have your branding there's art directing photography and film and designing digital spaces as well could you give us a bit of a sense of how this direction was decided especially when you're juggling so many different mediums mm -hmm. yeah luckily um george and i worked together um for a sweet green project and we really um, love working on the project, but we were definitely inspired heavily by their drive to create a positive impact on the future of food they're trying to create, but also like their respect for the, the farmers, uh, the cooks who's um, making the food, but also um, people who are serving the food. So we created a system that embrace um, their respect for the ingredients, um, the cooking process, and the people behind um, behind the food and the counter. So some of the things that we were inspired by were like um, hand painted vintage cookbooks, which influence our illustration work. And knowing their digital space is such a huge part of their um, platform. Um, we've created a photography style that works really well in those digital ordering environment, but also a very robust type system that's versatile enough for all of their um, needs in both in digital but also in physical spaces as well. Gosh, oh, it's great to hear you. Oh god, sorry, you George. Yeah, no, I was just gonna add in, I mean the other interesting kind of thing about sweet green and the tension that we noticed is they're a fast casual restaurant. So they're attempting to compete with um, you know, the the McDonald's, the Chipotle's, those other kinds of places that are serving up, um, you know, obviously less healthy versions of, of themselves. So we had to balance out a lot of the um, nutritional kind of organic focused um, style with convenience and speed. Um, so that meant that when we got into designing for a digital space, we had to really kind of um, overhaul that system to make sure it was as kind of seamless and easy to use, but also a joy to use as well, because we found that, you know, with food, there is a lot of joy that comes with that. So we wanted that um, to, to show in the work as well. Yeah, 
Definitely. And I guess maybe quite a contrasting client to Sweetgreen is your work for the paper company Crane, which I think is on the screen now. Um, and there was such a beautiful message behind this project, which it kind of detailed the importance of paper to allow us to disconnect from modern day technology. Um, again, it would be great to um, hear about how you decided on this message to be the root of your approach to Crane. Um, so yeah, Lucy, I'll take that one. Um, this was sort of a dream project for us as designers. Um, you know, we, we talk about salad and, uh, publishing channels and video games and beverages, all these kind of things. This is the stuff that we all want to create, right? When you get out of school, you want to make the printed thing. You want to use every finish. You want to use every surface, every texture. So to get to work on this was a dream project for us uh, as designers. I think the most eye-opening moment was going into their historical archives, um, seeing this tradition for over 250 years, um, seeing that Aaron Burr wrote his challenge uh, to Alexander Hamilton on crane paper, that Queen Elizabeth used crane uh, to share recipes for scones uh, with, with other world <laughs> leaders, that Warhol used crane paper bond number nine um, for his Chairman Mao series. But then to walk the factory and see craftspeople um, who invest all their time and energy and knowledge into creating this perfect piece of stationery. So to get to do that early on was so eye-opening and so inspiring. I wanna go back to something you said before I continue to romanticize my love of paper, um, <laughs> is, is you said, you know, disconnect. Um, disconnect from technology and figure out how you're going to use these things moving forward in 2021. For us, it was never about necessarily disconnecting so much as reestablishing paper as a vital medium. So a, we would never suggest to say, you know, stop chatting, stop texting, <laughs> stop um, going on Facebook or posting memes, we're, we're not saying that. What we are saying is if you have the time, paper can be this incredibly contemplative moment, whether it's a simple thank you, whether it's sharing a recipe, doing a drawing, it gives you focus, um, in a way that we often forget about. Um, and Elizabeth Tallerman, who led the strategy on this assignment, shouts out Elizabeth Tallerman, hope you're listening. She wrote a sentence for us that said, the gift of tangible expression is quite literally the gift of our time and the ability for the receiver to hold it, hold on to it, and to come back again and again. You know, earlier George mentioned, um, starting with brand strategy or starting with visual provocations. Sometimes it's as simple as a piece of language that sums up walking that factory, walking through those historical archives, going back to letters that you've saved or letters that you wrote. Sometimes it's as simple as a beautiful sentence uh, to really open up the brief for this uh, kind of project. Does that answer your question? No, definitely. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. And just to hear that history and yeah, walk around the factory. It must have been such a brilliant project to work on. Um, well, no, Lucy, that's great. Lucy, I, I must say, just to say to hear about the, the history, you asked us earlier about the dialect of Collins. And mm. obviously the theme of this is tone of voice. If you come to visit our offices in New York or San Francisco, you will find um, an over 5,000 volume library that we had a, uh, a full-time librarian brought into the office to, to categorize according to the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> and 
And I think one of the most magical functions of that library is that when you have an idea, like when Sanook said, you're reading a piece of writing or poetry or listening to music or an interview, that you can just pull a book out either with intention or at random. Because it's not enough to just look at what's going on online. It's not enough to just look at the boards or the feeds. It would be arrogant for us to think that we're the first people to solve a particular challenge. So by going back hundreds of years into history like Crane or uh, even some of the cookbooks that Sanook and George referenced for Sweet Green, that's really where the magic happens. Yeah, no, and I think just as you say at the beginning around disconnecting, those two things should should and can exist amongst one another. So yeah, that's brilliant to hear. And I would love to visit that library one day. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Lucy, um, you are more than welcome to visit our new space <laughs> on Grand in Brooklyn, New York, opening in September, 2021. <laughs> Lovely, thank you, I'll take you up on that. Um, another recent piece of work of yours that I would love to touch on, I think, and thankfully it's just come on the screen in the loop now as well, is Collins's rebrand of Medium. Um, I remember when this came out and we were in the office and we loved how this rebrand inspired, was inspired by something as simple as a three dot ellipsis, which is just so beautiful. Um, could you maybe tell us the story behind how you identified this as an inspiration and yeah, the general experience of rebranding such a massive brand? Yeah, of course. Um, I think like, like Nick said, with a lot of these projects, we try to look within to find the answer. So rather than always pulling from some external sources, we find the most kind of interesting ideas. They're, they're already there. They're just kind of, you know, waiting to be discovered. And with the ellipsis, what we were so excited by when we started to um, sketch around it was that the currency of medium is all traded in words and ideas and language. And the fact that this symbol comes out of punctuation itself. We weren't adding some extraneous kind of decorative element. It was something that was so core to, um, to storytelling, to writing, to reading. Um, and the fact that we were then able to kind of shape that in a way that gave it um, movement and this idea of perspective, which can speak to, you know, there being multiple sides to any given story, I think um, that's where we started to get really excited by this as a symbol. No, that's great. And it, yeah, it's just so perfect. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. Um, I suppose maybe after discussing these three projects in particular, um, I think all of them showcase such like a brilliant in-depth understanding and uses of really different typographic styles from Collins. Um, I was wondering as three designers yourselves, what do you particularly enjoy about working with typography for such large scale brands as these? Um, maybe I can answer it first. Um, I yeah. think it's a little different when we work for a brand that has such a large scale and reach uh, versus when you work for a smaller client or like even like your own personal freelancing client. Um, but I think for a bigger brand with a larger scale, we often have to think about the real life logistics and the um, implications of choosing a type family or a typeface. For example, if the typeface like provides enough longevity, but also versatility for all of their future needs and current needs as well. But uh, for my personal work or like a smaller scale client, um, I'm drawn to something that are like really expressive, wild and like funky and almost like of the moment. So I like to kind of navigate between that two world. Um, so that, that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Prince George. <laughs> yeah, I think I think as an agency um, with typography, we're always staying in touch with uh, foundries and we've struck up really great collaborations over the years with multiple foundries. And 
staying abreast of kind of what's what's new and what's and what's kind of on the horizon and always trying to um, deliver something to our clients that can feel new and fresh and exciting and in many cases you know working with um, the typographers themselves to um, collaborate with us and kind of develop something um, that can be completely bespoke and tailor-made i i would just uh, love to bounce off that for a moment george uh, perhaps this is a teaching moment is when you work at uh, a studio such as ours, there's this amazing gift that the more people get to know you, the more you have access to amazing craftspeople out in the world. And we're so blessed in that we'll be working on a logo, we'll be working with a piece of type, and we'll reach out to the artist who created that, the typographer. And, you know, a lot of folks might be operating in such a fast paced environment, they might not consider that that's even an option. But, you know, just like you love a particular photograph or illustration or animation, uh, like Lulu showed earlier, wouldn't it be great if you could just reach out to those people and see if you can collaborate rather than trying to mimic something they've done and over the years we've gotten to work with people all over the world exactly for that reason it starts with a simple email or text message and then suddenly the network of creative geniuses that we get to work with expands every day Definitely. And I suppose on that note of collaboration, I'm sure lots of people in the audience would also love to know, like, what is just the best way to get people's work seen by the Collins team, whether they're a designer that's hoping to work with you or maybe a freelance photographer or illustrator that would love to yeah, collaborate on a project? I would say in terms of um, the most central resource, um, email jacosta at wearecollins.com. Jacosta <laughs> is the heartbeat of this company. Jacosta has recruited just about every single person here, along with obviously the very gifted Brian Collins. Um, that, that's the most central just to be on our radar. The other can be rather serendipitous. Um, a gentleman from Mumbai slid into my Instagram DMs probably about three, four months ago. And his work was unlike anything I had ever seen. So I called Jocasta immediately and I said, we need to get this, this fella interviewing with a few people at the company. I think I, I was just so heartbroken by this guy's portfolio that two weeks later, I think we, we made him an offer. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to slide into our Instagram DMs, but it, if the work is that arresting, um, perhaps that's one way to bypass the more central channels. I know, but it's great to know that you're open to that. So hopefully, yeah, people can definitely get in touch. Um, I'll just have a look for some audience questions um, now, just before we have to come to the end of our conversation. Um, we've got a brilliant question here from Georgia, um, which is, how do you think design agencies will need to adapt or evolve, if at all, over the next 10 years? So I'll put you on the spot there for our future. <laughs> So a lot has changed in the past 18 months, just from remote working. We were the sort of company that every two, three weeks, we would check in with our clients. We would travel to them. They would travel to us, whether that was in city or out of city. And suddenly we had to develop a new way of working where things became perhaps a little more iterative. Um, or a little more solve for one thing at a time rather than putting on the big show. That was remote, but it's going to play a role in how we work moving forward. Um, I think I was lucky to get to work in the world where you sort of 
made a great strategy, a compelling story. You could land it on a logo, a few proof of concepts, and then an exceptional client team would know how to execute on that. Now, uh, and I'm sure many of the people in the audience are noticing this, the complexity of, of what can often be rather ambiguous outcomes is only increasing. So you might say, I can't, I can't approve um, this particular design until I see it proven out across, you know, 150 different executions. And I think you, you may lose the more imaginative pieces of the work if we keep working that way. I think the clients and ourselves, we need to move back to center a little bit you know, understand that patience, imagination, and an appetite for risk is how this work gets done. Um, and often that starts with a very compelling story and a great idea. Um, so I think as the in-house studios continue to rise and studios like ours um, can continue to collaborate, we're gonna have to find better ways of communicating and and understanding that the best work doesn't come from trying to solve it 300 different ways at dawn um does that answer your question yes no definitely no that's great to hear um another question i'll just try and get through some more of these audience questions before we have to wrap up but a lovely one that i would love to hear as well just from anna in the audience is simply what were your favorite projects to work on at collins i'm not sure who wants to take that one but go for it that's also a hard one because there's a lot of projects that we haven't released in the world, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I would say Sweet Green was my um, my top projects that I worked on at Collins. Um, it was incredible to work with a very collaborative client who um, fully trusted our vision and was really transparent with how they feel and what they wanted and. Um, I like the team that I worked on, uh, that I worked with, um, George, with like Tom Wilder, um, who used to work at Collins as well. Um, and just to be able to work uh, on a rebranding project that has a massive like scale and um, cultural relevancy um, was a really great experience for me. Definitely, yeah. And to see it out in the world now as well must be amazing. Yes. <laughs> I, I would say off the top of my head, certainly Crane Match, which was led by George and Zuzana on our team, um, Naturalizer with Brian, Flora Chan, um, the Azealia Banks music video, um, and probably my favorite initiative we ever launched at Collins, which is the high school internship program. Um, where we've started to take on high school interns every year. So a little bit different than a case study, but uh, something I think we all really believe in. No, that's brilliant to hear. Cause we've actually, we do have, oh, sorry, go on George. Prince George. No, I was, I was just gonna quick, I was just gonna quickly add on that um, I have a particular soft spot for Clubhouse, which we've only teased so far, but um, we've been working, Nick and I have been working with them uh, over the past six to eight months or so, and lots of exciting yeah. things to to come up with them in the future. Amazing, George, one to look for. They, they just released the latest photograph of the app icon. So, Lucy, I don't know if you know this, but we redesigned their app icon so there's no typography on it. It's only people making C's with their hand. Um, and the new one came out two days ago. So shouts out the team at Clubhouse. Wow, amazing. That's great. Um, yeah, I just back to the um, the high school internship. I'd love to hear more about that, especially because Donna in the audience has asked the question um, around, does Collins only tend to hire designers with a design degree or from a traditional design background? But that sounds like an amazing initiative that you've just launched. 
Yeah, and I think if anybody wants to reach out to Jocasta at wearecollins.com or Brian at wearecollins.com, we could certainly provide some more in-depth info, but this started approximately six years ago when Jocasta um, really spearheaded this initiative and noticed a lack of diversity um, within agency and studio culture. And, you know, that didn't just start, you know, applying for jobs. It also started at the college level where perhaps the colleges weren't particularly diverse. So Jocasta had the idea of, I want to say this is the summer of 15. Um, we toured, I think, six different high schools in New York City, and we went to their art program. And we were looking at painting and uh, drawings, two-dimensional sculpture, poetry, whatever these high school students were excited about. And we had them all submit portfolios and statements of intention. And we chose two, um, two students per year to shadow us on strategy, design, operations, account management, just to feel out what this sort of career uh, might have in store for you. Mm -hmm. Every year, the previous two students return to mentor the next two students. Um, that has been going now six years and shouts out uh, Nicole Cousins, who's one of our earliest interns who recently graduated college and got herself a job at Collins. So, you know, since then, um, since, and I, I still, I could recite what I saw in her portfolio five years ago. She's a wonderful mm -hmm. candidate, but wasn't really yeah. trying to be a graphic designer necessarily. Um, since then, oh, that... people have looked at Jocasta and um, certainly us for how to replicate that program within their own studio. And Brian and Jocasta are so eager to share that information. So, you know, hopefully in 10 years, we could have a much more uh, diverse mm -hmm. category uh, within all our fields if everybody just tries a little bit harder. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I'm afraid I've actually got to ask you the final question now. That's gone by so quickly. But um, I also just lastly wanted to congratulate you also on receiving the amazing recognition this year um, when Collins was announced Design Company of the Year by DNAD, which is no small thing. Um, and I suppose without putting you on the spot too much, I was wondering why you feel that Collins received this award. And I suppose what does this type of recognition mean to you as we kind of yeah wrap up our conversation um i can start first i think it's because of the incredible uh, members of our team here at collins i think we all like each other we like working together <laughs> and we also hang outside of work together a lot so i think that love and friendship really shows and no one's like egotistical and we're all like working towards a general purpose and i think that collaborative process uh, means a lot to me personally and to us as a group but i'll open it up to nick and george as well <laughs> no I, I i can only agree i mean yeah it's 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 a combination of of the team, both internally, it's a combination of the many people that that we collaborate with, um, and just kind of the hard work and, and effort that we put in, and also, you know, the the clients that come to us um, and that are willing to kind of take a risk on us, knowing that we're not, you know, a safe bet, and we're not kind of um, trying to create work that is. Um, safe in in any way shape or form so i think it's really a combination of all those things mm -hmm. definitely and I, i'll just say lucy there's so many people behind the scenes you know certainly that might not be featured on a, it's nice that right uh, rightfully so but in order for me to do my job or any of us to do our job we have an incredibly talented 
business and operations team, an incredibly talented strategy team. Uh, we have office managers that ensured that all of us had laptops, high-speed internet, uh, <laughs> software, all the communication tools we needed during the pandemic. Um, none of this work gets done without the entire team at Collins. And that goes from business management to strategic frameworks to super behind the scenes. I want to shout out Vicki Lewis, um, who runs finance at Collins. Um, <laughs> none of this would be possible uh, without any of them. So I, I think we won uh, because of the strength of those collaborations internally. Yeah, no, and that's, yeah, that's amazing to hear you shout out all of those people. It's very well deserved. But um, yeah, that's a lovely note to end on as well. Thank you very much. That was an amazing conversation to be a part of. But yeah, I'm really sad that we have to leave it there. But thank you very much, guys. That was lovely. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Lucy.